Welcome to the latest edition of the Hub of Champions podcast with your host, Shukri Wrights. It's a two-box edition of the podcast, which means there is a guest on the pod. And this guest is someone who I've had on my personal pod before, almost three years ago, which is hard to believe. I mean, time flies. That long, I mean, huh? I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we both got grays in our hairs, but I mean, that's just not giving away our ages here. But <laughs> with that being said, <laughs> with that being said, it is so. It is someone that Boston sports fans are incredibly are familiar with. He's either in either he's either entertained you or he's either pissed you off if you're a Boston sports fan. <laughs> That's Tony Maserati of 98.5 The Sports Up at NBC Sports Boston. Calls of Felger and Mass weekday afternoons from two to six. Tony, how are you doing? I'm good, man. How you doing, Shukri? I'm already clapping flies, so that must be a good sign. <laughs> um, but I'm good, man. I, I'm I'm happy to have you back on, man. Like it's been. It's been forever, but obviously we've, we've kept in touch and whatnot. And I mean, what I mean, what a time! What a time to be alive um, in Boston, especially for everything that's going on as it pertains to the Patriots. It seems like um, the end of a new of an old era, the beginning of a new one. Obviously, with Gerard Mayer now the head coach of the Patriots, and now suddenly we have a show all tell all documentary that's been the talk of the town. In case if you haven't heard, the P- the Dynasty, the new docu-series on Apple Plus has now been released. The first two episodes are out, and people are talking. So, Tony, I want to get your thoughts on the first two episodes. What has stood out to you, and what has impressed you about the docu-series so far? Well, so, uh, well, I mean, like a lot of people, for me, there is a lot of footage and, um, you know, audio-visual uh, component there, obviously, that has some, you know, some fresh stuff in there. And I think the interviews have been terrific so far. Uh, I find uh, Ty Law to be particularly entertaining. Uh, He's just great to listen to. He's just a great talker, always has been. And we've been talking about this on the show and in a lot of ways, if not every way, uh, Felger is really a a, a great authority on this because he was covering the team at the time. And so uh, I think some of the points that he has made on our show are, are fair. I initially, when we first talked about it, he said that, you know, he thought that the the Brady decision over a Bledsoe was overblown. And I thought, what? What do you mean overblown? Like, what What are oh. you talking about? And, you know, I think what he really, you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, but he said that he just thought that the timeline of events was off. And, and that I agree with him on. I, you know, I just, uh, my, my point with the story was at that time, the Brady, uh, the uh, Brady, Be- I was going to say Brady Belichick. I'm so used to saying Brady Belichick. It's the okay. Brady Bledsoe decision at the time was just obviously a massive, massive thing. And if you didn't live through it, you don't remember how much it dominated a sports media discussion during that time. So understandably so, you know, Bledsoe was a, a multi-million dollar quarterback that the team had uh, drafted and signed in the 90s and was right around 30 years old at the time and taken a lot of hits uh including the one that opened the door for Brady I, I don't mean to you know I don't need to relive it for you here we, we're all watching the thing but I thought yeah. overall I think it's it's well done I think it's well handled I think we are starting to get a sense early on that there's a clearly a craft bias in the thing, and when I say bias, I don't mean yet that it's unfair, but that it's it's the entire docu series is I think uh, made from the perspective of largely Robert Kraft and team ownership, yeah. uh, which again is fine. You know, somebody has to back the thing, so you know, and want to do it to get access. So I get that. Uh, you know, I don't think it has been patently unfair or anything up to this point, but. Uh, you know, the story's just beginning, as we all know, the really controversial stuff comes at the end. So, but so far I like it. I really enjoy it. I'm looking forward to the next two. And again, Mike and I have talked about this on the air. I'm, I'm sort of throwing a lot at you here, Shukri. But, oh, no, no, uh, no. You're good. You're good. You're good. Yeah. I, you know, the, we're going to watch it in installments. So, yeah. uh, and to be honest with you, as we're re- recording this, uh, I just watched the first episode again with my son who's 16 hadn't seen it. And I told him, I, you know, we should watch it together. Cause I want you to ask me questions. And um, so I just watched the first one again. We'll watch the second one before the next two drop later in the week. The thing that I, that I, I can't help but to just think about is because I've always believed that context is everything. And, 
in in our in our conversations and interactions over over time is that context is everything when you talk about sports and you talk about storylines you talk about everything that that happens when it happens and so forth and we're all going to go back to 2001 because again context for me is everything so here's the context obviously you 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 know well about it but for the younger audience who who didn't live through it like like, like we did I mean, I mean, as a sports fan and whatnot, this is literally right after 9-11 when, when the Mola was hit, um, hit happened. It was literally the first game back from 9-11. That's number one. Yep. Number two, this was before social media, and Drew Bledsoe had just signed that $100 million contract extension prior to the start of the 2001 season. Correct. So... There was financial investment by the Patriots, by Kraft and Belichick, just before the 2001 season, when the Molus Lewis um, hit happened, and I and I wonder about this from a historical perspective. Now, is you mentioned how massive of a deal this was. What ultimately went into the, the decision in terms of sticking with Brady, because Bledsoe, as we all know, he, he was healthy. He came back. He was ready to go. But Belichick just said, you know what? No, Brady is going to be the guy moving forward. And I thought the national response at that time was, I would say, I wouldn't say vicious, but it was strong. Would, would you agree with that? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And look, the contract had a lot to do with it. Yeah. So when the, when the Patriots signed Bledsoe at that time, there was a, Okay, well, they're committing to this guy for the future here. This is this is going to be the horse going forward, and um, and I think that that is why so many people believe that Bledsoe was going to get the job back. Now, look, Felger's point is a good one. People were sick of Bledsoe at that stage. I wouldn't say there was necessarily controversy over the contract because, again, Tom Brady was a sixth round draft pick. Yeah. It, it's not like they drafted him with the idea that he was going to be the starter in a couple of years. Nobody knew who Brady was. We had no idea who Brady was. This is all lost now because of the way the, the thing unfolded and because of how Brady's career completely exploded into the greatest career in the history of the league. So, But at the time, everyone just assumed, well, they have all this money sunk in blood, so... They clearly uh, don't know really what Brady is. And anyone who tells you that they, they knew what Brady was after five games is lying. Nobody, there was no way to know that. So that was a big part of the story. And it took, you know, it did take some guts for Bill to make that decision. Now, I can tell you that at the time when the season turned around, they were 0-2. Yep. They made the switch. And then with Brady as the starter, they went five and two over the next seven games. And so five and two for the Patriots back then might as well have been 10 and all. Like, <laughs> you know, they were so bad there um, through the majority of their history that all of a sudden it was like, whoa, hey, what do we got here? Mm -hmm. And so when the team responded, and this is not revisionist history, uh, I remember saying, you can't, you can't put Bledsoe back in now. You got to go with what's working. And they're winning, so you leave Brady in. And I will say, I, I do agree generally that a majority of people probably felt that way. I don't, you know, it was it was pretty split. But if you want to tell me, like Felger said the other day on the air, it was 60-40. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll buy that. I, what I know is that it was not 90-10. I mean, it was nope. a discussion. It was a debate. and uh, And all of us who watch and cover sports always say you do what what's best for the team to win games and at that time keeping brady in was the right thing it just seemed unlikely because of the money that bledsoe was making and what they had given him uh so when when belichick stuck with brady it was controversial hmm. and back then like controversy all we had was Media, you turn into ESPN, you tune in to ESPN News or, or, or whatever like sports network was available at the time, and that was was that was was what dominated the um, the that areas back then. Yeah, that that was it. There was no NFL Network again. Addressing the the younger audience, there was no NFL Network. NFL Network didn't debut until two thousand three, so you didn't have league specific 
networks to cover the story. So back then, what you saw on ESPN is pretty much what you got and, 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 and so forth. So when you look at on docu-series like this one with the Dynasty with Apple TV+, Plus, and I'm going to compare it with another recent docu-series that came out just a couple of years ago at, at, at least. And I'm talking about Man in the, in the Arena. They came out during the 2021 season. Yeah. And for those of you that watch that, that docuseries, I find some similarities in some in some contrast between the two. I think the similarities, it, the similarities is that when you look at 2001 in the beginning, not just 2001, but the beginning stages, because Man in the Arena kind of touched on that a little bit, but the dynasty goes further more into the groundwork that was laid uh, laid down by the Patriots, especially during the 2000 se- on season, which I thought that was really important because people people like to look at the 2001 um, season. I know that was a championship season, but and I talked about this a little bit with Matt Chatham, who was on this podcast, and he said the groundwork was 100% laid during the 2000 season in terms of who was going to be there for 01, who was going to be part of the program. So I'll ask you this. Do you if if you remember much about the Man and Arena docu series on ESPN Plus in comparison with the Dynasty now? Do you see any similarities or or any differences between the two? And if so, what stands out to you? So Shukri, I actually didn't watch a lot of the Man in the Arena. Okay. Um, and you know, forgive me for you know that negligence. The the reason I didn't is I watched the Facebook series on Brady. Yeah, so did I. Mm-hmm. The man in the arena came out shortly thereafter. Yep. And I thought, I, I don't need to watch all these like right now. I just don't. <laughs> so I, I took that. I know I really, I, I took that one off now uh, in terms of, you know, what the, the similarities and the differences and whether or not, I mean, to some degree, I think there was a foundation set in 2000, but Again, Brady wasn't remotely part of that season. Now, Chatham can say behind the scenes, and I would agree, you know, Brady, after a year in the system, in training camp of 2001, had climbed the depth chart and all of a sudden was the primary backup. So there was a lot of progress and development that had taken place with Brady during 2000 that set up 2001. That I will agree with. In terms of what the team was, you know, Bledsoe was still the starting quarterback and they sucked in the first two games. So, you know, under a uh, Belichick, they were five and 13 going into week three when Brady got his first start. So I think, you know, as much as you can say, there was a foundation set, but quarterback is such a critical yes. position that who knows how many weeks it would have continued to go on before they made a switch and people around that team that time. And again, I'll keep citing Felger here because I've worked with him for 14 years. We've Mm -hmm. talked about this a million times and I know, and he was covering the team at the time I was covering the Red Sox, but I I do remember Mike saying uh, that he believes that Brady was coming. You know, it was clear. It was apparent to everybody in the organization that, okay, Brady jumped up the depth chart. And before long, he's going to be on Bledsoe's heels if he wasn't already. So now, would that have happened in week three? Would it have happened in week seven? Would it have happened in week 10? I don't know. Uh, What I do know is that when it happened was fortunate. Not just the fact that it happened, but when it happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it was early enough in the season, Shukri, where they could salvage it. If they had been, like, look at this year where they were one in five and you know, falling apart, like, or what I think it was one in five. I don't even remember at this stage, but you know, they were so bad early that it was, it was not salvageable. It was, it fell apart. There was too much of the season gone and they couldn't recover. Um, you know, back then it happened early enough. So from that standpoint, yes, I would say there was a foundation laid with Brady with the rest of the team. I'm not so sure. I, nobody knew what was coming. There was no way to know what was coming, including the players on the team who had seen Brady climb the depth chart. They still couldn't have predicted how we would have done in games, not as a sixth round pick. So the whole thing was just an unbelievable story. It's an unbelievable story, even just looking back on it now, because it's it almost seems as if it's like it's mythical, if you will. It's like did it really happen? Like, no, it, it happened. It happened all right. And 
And like, and, and and last question on on this particular um topic because it's I feel like I feel like this is more polarizing than Man in Arena, and this is not recency bias I'm talking about. This is like something that's been talked about like almost from from like beginning to end. It's been like like beat down to a grain of salt, if you will. And I find it to be remarkable that almost 23 years later. It is still such a uh, still such a, a polarizing topic because, and I think part of it is because Belichick just got let go, and uh-huh. we witnessed the end of the Belichick era in New England and how it came to a, a screeching halt. Interesting question: If the air, if this era ended differently for Belichick, would we look back at two thousand one in the way that has been portrayed in this docu series? any differently or do you still believe because of because of how things ended this past season with Belichick's final season as head coach and GM of the Patriots that we look back at that at that 2001 season the way that was covered in a docuseries with um with, with a critical eye but as well as an eye of hey you know what I think they've they've hit on every point that needed to be hit on on during in terms of that season I think that the timing of it definitely affect, uh, affects our uh, perspective on it. Mm. So it's impossible not to, right? We just saw the thing come apart, which is, again, when you say more polarizing than the man in the arena, which, again, I did not watch. <laughs> so, it's okay. No, no, no. But I I, I say it as a half, a half joke. You know, so you got to draw the line somewhere sometimes. Fair but enough. <laughs> I, I will tell you, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll just say that the timing absolutely fa- factors in. This is all... The thing has now crumbled. It's over. And the end for Belichick was not good. The end for Brady here wasn't good. It got better when um, he went to Tampa and he wrote his own ending in a lot of ways. Uh, not a lot of ways he did. But, uh, you know, so we, there, there's there's some, as you said, some of the nerves are still raw and exposed from the Belichick part of the story. So it's definitely affecting our our vantage point on it. Um, I, I personally don't think it's a coincidence that this was released right after Bill got fired. I think the Crafts wanted it to be their version of the story. They knew what was in it. Bill does not sound especially happy during this documentary to be doing the <laughs> interviews. Yeah. So, and I said, you know, let, let's remember that when Belichick did 2009, A Football Life, and it was his story, yeah. Kraft did not come across well in that. There's a famous scene that we joke about where Bill is is uh, sitting at his desk eating his uh, salad. Yeah, I remember and, the scene. Yep. Uh, Kraft is asking him questions, and Belichick won't give him the time of day. You know, and it's almost like, well, why is the owner bothering the coach with these questions, right? So I I think they each have had you know, and I'm sure there'll be another Belichick story to be told about the final 15 years of the Patriots uh, dynasty and really his the second half of his career, uh, if that's what you want to call it. So. You know, to me, again, this is being told through Kraft's eyes. Belichick certainly has a chance to defend himself, but the end for him here wasn't good. So a lot of people are happy to beat up on him right now. It's almost like a meat that's hanging in front of a lion. It's like easy yeah. picking. Yeah, that's and, exactly right. And and it's and, and and I find it to be, I find it to be comical, but yet amazed that even in Boston, like because I feel like this is. This is one of two markets in a country where this can happen, it, and it can be a storyline and topic of discussion in sports radio for weeks, if not months at a time, and Boston is one of the two. And speaking of storylines, because here we are at the end of February, and baseball is upon us, and I am I'm fired up for baseball season to begin with, but after speaking with Lenny Donardo of Nesson, who I had on my previous um, episode, yeah, and I and I asked him to talk about the Red Sox and as well as like looking forward to the season ahead, and I I look at this team with such a critical eye because of their refusal to re, to invest into this team. I'm talking financially, but in terms of like personnel, like getting what is needed and. Today, interestingly enough, Rafael Devers, the face of the franchise, comes out and slams the Red Sox organization. 
And for those of you that are listening and are going to be watching this podcast later, I encourage you to go watch it. I can't remember the last time the, the face of the Red Sox did something like that where he basically went scorched earth with the exception of David Ortiz. But even David Ortiz wasn't even this, this remotely blunt. So, right. Tony, for, for Rafael Devers to come out and basically verbalize that he is angry and disappointed that the team has not done more to invest into this roster, what does that tell you in terms of how it portrays the Red Sox ownership in front office? So uh, I was surprised it happened, and I'll, I'll be candid. I'm pleasantly surprised because I think sometimes there are occasions, not always, where a star player has to come out and call out the franchise. And whether that's the GM or uh, the owner or, you know, whoever you want. I mean, take your pick. Um, every once in a long while it has to happen because he's the one guy that's protected. And when I say that, I mean, Raphael Devers is $300 million guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So whether they want to keep him or trade him, he's getting paid. He's set for the rest of his life. And that empowers him to speak. And there aren't a lot of players on this roster, especially they can do that anymore. So uh, I think it needed to be said. I give I give Devers all the credit in the world. And again, I, I say I'm pleasantly surprised because he sort of has a happy-go-lucky kind of personality. Yeah. And, you know, but this was a real kind of leadership thing for, for Raphael Devers. And I don't think that that should be overlooked. And when I say leadership, I'm talking about in the clubhouse. Ownership probably hates it. Uh, I can't imagine they would like it, no. but for the uh, for the guys in the clubhouse, for the respect that Devers ultimately wants to get from his teammates, he has to say what many of them are feeling. And uh, so I I think it's necessary. I think that the, the part I don't understand is, you know, and, and I'm speaking for me here. I understand fans want championships every year, but I think most of them are realistic that you're not going to get a title every year. What you can expect, though, is a good product. Mm -hmm. And I'm astonished that the Red Sox, who value their business as much as they do and value the TV show of the Red Sox as much as they do, have put a substandard product on the field, really, for four of the, five, four of the last five years. Now, 2019 is hard to blame them. The team underachieved. They had the roster. Um. And then, you know, 2021 was a relatively good year. And, and so, uh, you know, in terms of ownership, now I'm talking. Yeah. The other three years have been a, a complete debacle. So, uh, you know, for a group that I thought cared about the business of the Red Sox, I frankly, I think they've been running a bad business mm -hmm. for the last, you know, three or four years. And um, I'm surprised that they've been as passive as they have with this roster. I thought with a new chief executive and um, dwindling TV ratings that they would be more aggressive and at least try to put more of the pieces in place going forward that they could, you know, then I, I say raise or develop their young players in. Yeah. And they didn't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm borderline stunned that they, I, I, I don't know what to think about them anymore. I've, I've lost a lot of, uh, core beliefs of what I had about this ownership in the last four years. I think a lot of people have. What is the chief reason why you've lost that on lost a lot of, of your core belief that you once had for this ownership group over the last four years? Because it feels like they're not as serious Shukri. Mm. And, and I don't know any other way to put it. You know, they, they can sit there and tell me all, all they want that, that. And again, my relationships with them over the years have been up and down. I would say, Generally speaking, the last three or four years, it's been better. It's been good. But I also have to call it like I see it. And so uh, it just doesn't feel like they are as intent on winning and putting out a good product as they were in the past. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can say, well, we've underachieved, we're rebuilding. And, and, I, and I agree, they, they, they have underachieved to a degree. And they are rebuilding. But I also think that I, I, I'll give you a perfect quick example. Nobody expects them to win the World Series this year, given where they've been. Okay. Yeah. They made a couple of moves, but the one thing they needed more than anything else was starting pitching. And frankly, yeah. they need somebody who has some potential to win a big game 
so that when they get into a series or a stretch during the year, that person can come out and pitch. You can call it an ace. I'm just going to call it a front end starter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not, I'm not looking for Pedro at this stage because he's not there. Yamamoto would have been nice, but I think they underestimated what the market was going to require to get this kind of pitching at this stage. Just Jordan Montgomery can help. Mm -hmm. Now, does it deliver a world series? No, in all probability, but that doesn't mean it's a bad move. Like this idea that it's, if you, if the move can't de deliver you a championship, then you don't make it. Well, then nobody will make any moves. Like, you know, you're going to get one move every two years. It's or, or less. It, it's yeah. just ridiculous. And more importantly, I look at them and say, they have no pitching coming through their system. Mm. This was a good market to get pitching on. You had to pay for it one way or the other, but it was a good pitching market. They didn't get anybody. So if and when these young guys develop, when, when are they going to get the pitching that they need? Like, they don't have it in the system. This was a great free agent class. I don't know when the next one's going to be. It's not going to be this year. Mm -hmm. So, like, then what? Then you're still going to be searching for the pitching to win a championship. Why not bite the bullet, sign a guy like Jordan Montgomery, four years, if that's what it is, that's what it is. You're the Red Sox. You can afford it. You keep developing pitching. And maybe you win 86 games this year and sneak into the playoffs. Maybe he's enough to get you there. So between him, Giolito, Bayo, Whitlock, Hauk, Pavetta, maybe a couple of guys have better years and then you got a shot. And when I say shot, I'm talking about making the playoffs, getting in as a wild card. To take this approach where you do nothing just kills morale, kills morale in the clubhouse, kills the morale and interest level of your fan base. You got to do more. You got to do more than that or people will just tune out. I was shocked that they didn't do more to address the starting um, pitching. And I talked about it in the last episode and I'm referencing it because like it was, it was 100% Red Sox talk, baseball talk. And I thought that if anything else, if they weren't going to go get Blake Snell, once they, once they were out on Yamamoto, it told me they're not getting Blake Snell. But Jordan Montgomery, and I agree with you, Tony, like he is a difference maker, especially on, on the front end of your rotation. For a pitching rotation that was bad last year, and you traded away Chris Sale to Atlanta, and, and you in that, in that trade, you get back on, on Ron Von, uh, Grissom as well. Right. And... I just feel as if that if you are going to compete in a division that it got a lot more tougher. Baltimore is that team I strongly believe it is to be feared now. Mm -hmm. Two reasons. Because they just traded for Corbin Burns, formerly of the Milwaukee Brewers, who only makes that rotation even stronger after a 101 win season last year. And then number two, speaking of ownership, they have new ownership coming into the fray in Baltimore. Correct. And I talked about this in, in, some, in some episodes back, but Red Sox fans, this is bad news. You have an, a, an ownership that's not even willing to, to invest into this roster currently right now. And you're going into the season where you still got the Yankees to worry about. I'm going to say what you were about the Yankees, but at least they went out and they, and they got themselves a one on soda, and there's a chance that they might get Blake Snell. You still got Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is always competing year in and year out. And in Toronto, don't underestimate Tom on Toronto because it is always seemingly they're one move away, they're one piece away. The pitching still worries me just a little bit, but they, they but they're right there, and the Red Sox are standing pat. Like, how much do you like do, do you look at the division and say, man, this division got stronger? Meanwhile, the Red Sox and the old adage goes, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. The Red Sox are always more ways than one they've gotten worse. So look, all of that. I again, I I got no arguments for you. I, I I'm I'm as frustrated as anybody, and you know, you, like people can look at the Blue Jays and say, you know, Shukri, you're right, they're good, but they're not that good. You know, they're they're not going to win the World Series. There's something missing there. My answer would be, they're still better than the Red Sox. The point no. is, you know, whether they're a World Series team or not. 
They're better than the Red Sox. And la- a couple of years ago, what did they go? 16 and two against the Red Sox or something? Yeah. 16, 16 and three, two. something like that. Yeah. I mean, it was some ridiculous, uh, 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 you know, record against the Red Sox. And Toronto just completely dominated. And so those losses still hurt the Red Sox. Whether or not Toronto's world chip, championship caliber is irrelevant. You know, so yeah. the, the point is right now, they're still in last place in the division. Everybody's better than them. And again, my concern is it has become it's one thing to say, spend the money, spend the money, spend the money. I just want them to get better. Okay. So get better. I don't think they're getting better. I don't, I in fact, I they may have gotten worse when you really look at it. And and I look at the whole thing and say, not only is it not getting better, when is it going to be good again? Like, mm. tell me. I, again, where is the pitching going to come from if you weren't going to buy for, buy it or trade for it on this market? You don't have guys ready to come up and pitch in the big leagues in a year. They don't have guys like that. They're pitching, it, it, and you know this. I, I don't know if you saw this. How this whole thing broke down during the uh, early January, I saw some of the minor league rankings, and I I, I sent out a tweet that said, "Hey, does anybody out there know?" You know, is there an evaluation service, Baseball America, MLB Pipeline, whoever? Is there someone who evaluates the systems that breaks down pitching versus positional players? So, in other words, your overall ranking might be 15th, but you're first in pitching and you're 30th in positional players, right? Like, and I think there's a difference because pitching is the most valuable commodity in the game. You know, that's gold, right? Pitching is gold. If we're talking about it in terms of being a commodity. Yeah. And so the reply I got on Twitter was from a guy named Zach Scott, who used to be in the Red Sox front office, Mm. who then became the interim GM of the Mets. uh, And then, you know, had a off field incident. I think it was a DWI and he ended up not getting rehired by the Mets. But he now runs a, a an analytics service. Zach Scott said he did his own study on this, and the Red Sox in positional prospects ranked third, but in pitching ranked 29th out of the 30 teams. Wow. Okay, 29th. So you have an organization that has finished last three times in four years that has no pitching in the system, whose best starter right now is Lucas Giolito, who, if he has a good year, can opt out of his contract. Where's the long-term pitching solution? It doesn't exist. So let's say some of these youngsters can play. Tristan Casas looks like a good one. Maybe Kyle Teal is. Uh, Marcelo Meyer. Like, we'll see. We don't know yet, but high picks. Okay, fine. If those guys get good and you don't want to trade them, mm-hmm. how are you going to get your pitching? Where's it coming from? So, like, this is my concern. So then you're going to be what? An 85 win team that can't pitch and loses in the play? You'll be the Blue Jays. Yeah. So, you know, I, I I just don't know. It doesn't feel like there's a long term plan in place. I, I don't. John Tomasi of NBC Sports made this point to me. You know, he said, the Cubs signed John Lester when they stunk. Then they got good and he was there to pitch the World Series for them. I feel like the Red Sox are behind it. They're, they're behind mm. that. They're chasing it. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any real long-term plan. And, and I think there lies within the issue when you don't have a long-term plan, but then you put out a statement like we're going to go full throttle and you, in the process, lie to the fans, and you wonder why the fan reaction at on Red Sox uh, we, Winter Weekend was as fierce and strong as it was. Like there, there, there lies with their last put within the button. You can't like sell work an idea. We're gonna go hard. We're gonna go hard in the paint. We're gonna drive towards the net, and then you flounder. You're not. You don't even come up show. You just floundered. You didn't even get up, get past the starting starting line. Like it's just, I think it's incredibly disingenuous if you, as a multi billion dollar uh, franchise, you're going to make all these empty promises and 
you don't deliver. So going into into the season, and I and I'm picking up a theme from the people that I spoke to that that that, that love the Red Sox and that follow the team religiously, like yourself, um, Lenny Donato, who obviously covers the team for Nesson and and a few others, that they can't remember a time where they have been like not as excited. They 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 can't remember a time where their their like their enthusiasm has not been as high, has been as low as it is going into a season because of because of the of the lack a lack of uh, moves and lack of idea of direction and, and so forth. And I think that's and I think that's just a bad place to put themselves in. And, and in conclusion, and I, in conclusion, I just I just wonder and in all seriousness, if they were going to make a move in firing Heimbloom. And they're still keeping the same philosophy by and large part. Why even make the change from High and Bloom to Craig Breslow? I I, I don't get it. Because uh I think they uh I think they looked at High and Bloom and said, right philosophy, wrong guy. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think they looked at Bloom and said, when it came time to make certain decisions, he wasn't capable of making them. So they now they just look at Bred Breslow and say, he hopefully he's the right guy for this philosophy that they're more married to the philosophy than they are the guy. So I, mm-hmm. you know, I'll put it this way. You remember the old the famous line, Bill Parcells, they want you to cook dinner. They got to let you make the, they got to yes. let you shop for some of the groceries. Yep. Okay. So here's what I would tell you. The Red Sox didn't ownership now didn't like mm-hmm. dinner. So they hired a new chef. Mm-hmm. The ingredients are the same, still the same ingredients. They just brought in a new chef. So, well, how do you expect me to make filet mignon if all you're giving me is ground beef? Okay. So, which is, that's the way I look at it. I think that in their minds, you know, the chef was the problem when the reality is the ingredients are the problem. And so uh, I'm not, you know, I, I, because your point, Breslow is bloom is fair. And Breslow has even said this off season didn't go as anticipated. I think they were delusional about what pitching was going to cost. I think this was going to be a expensive market for pitching. Blake Snell, Otani, Yamamoto, like these guys were going to go for big dollars and Snell's still available. I think Snell was overpriced. I just stayed away from him. But Yamamoto, I think the Red Sox thought that they were going to get Yamamoto for $200 million, eight years. It came in at three and a quarter. They missed by a mile. And what they underestimated was the Yankees were going to need pitching. The Dodgers were going to want pitching. The Cubs were going to want pitching. You know, uh, who did I leave out? Uh, the, did I say the Yankees? Like Yankees. the Mets. Mm-hmm. They, so the point is, there were going to be a lot of teams in it. A lot of big market teams. So now when it was time to bid, they weren't in a position where they could bid. Or, or they could lure a talent to come here, which is another problem. If you suck every year, then a guy like Yamamoto hits the market. Is he going to take you seriously? I don't think he is. Nope. He's going to look at you and go, why the hell would I come there when the Dodgers will give me every nickel that you'll give me and they're good? Why would mm. I come there? And the weather sucks too, by the way. Like, you know, <laughs> so there's all that stuff, right? Like, so this is what I mean by you, you have to, you can't all of a sudden decide, okay, we're ready. Now we're going to turn on the faucet and go get all this talent. No, you got to build it in steps. Yep. And so you got to make yourself appealing along the way. So someone goes, oh, geez, look what they're doing in Boston. You know, now they now they want to really spend and now they're going to bring me in. Whereas if they, you know, which is why I'm in favor of Jordan Montgomery. I, at this stage, like, they're just so uninspiring. It's really, it's demoralizing. It's basically opening a new book and you have absolutely nothing to lead you into the into the main story and it's exactly it's, right it's it, it it really is and another a team that plays on causeway inspiring yes but there's a part of me that that feels as if and maybe it's just because i am feeling rather a little jaded from the nba all-star game where i am i am so angry about the fact that i wasted my time watching that game on sunday night yeah, where um, like two hundred and eleven to one eighty six. At that point, I I was I was rather I was better off going play with marbles somewhere. Like like <laughs> I mean I mean goodness for goodness sake. So it was it was truly like really the disrespect 
And I saw a clip earlier today of the 2001 All-Star game, which I remember fondly. It was played in D.C. The late Kobe Bryant, Allen Iverson, the Kevin Mutombo. These are all NBA legends, Hall of Famers, and so forth. And that game was competitive. So I'm like, you go back to 2001, you, you have a competitive All-Star game. Now it's basically like, <laughs> we're just going to dribble slowly, pick up the ball at half court, and just fire on deep shot threes. Got it. Because after all, the East, that's what the Eastern Conference did. And I walked away from that saying to myself, why has it changed the mentality? And I thought Anthony Edwards' comments after the game was most telling. That we show up and it's it's a break for us. Where did the laziness come into play? And, and, and Tony, like, do you think that it's a generational gap between the players of yesteryear and now? Or do you think the fact the fact of the matter is the players just don't care the way that they used to when it comes to the All-Star game? I think it's both of those. Mm-hmm. I think that um, – and this is true, by the way, in all sports. It's not just an NBA thing. Mm-hmm. You know, baseball's got a problem with the All-Star game too. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just the, the intensity doesn't show up. But they all do. Uh, the intensity doesn't show up um, as much in baseball because the game is played so slowly. But I, I don't know if you watch the NHL, NHL um, skills competitions. Oh, yep, yep. Kucherov was an embarrassment. Oh, yeah. He didn't even want to do the skills. That was an embarrassment. And so, you know, if these guys don't want to do it, if they'd rather have the time off, then take out the all-star bonuses. Don't give them their money. Don't invite them to the skills competition. They, you know, and they, they certainly get rewards for winning them. So blow it all up. It's not worth it. Now, again, the league won't do that because they're making money off it too. Mm-hmm. But to, to your a larger point and question about whether or not it's indicative of, you know, some sort of generational problem or, you know, the winning's not as important. I would say all the above, look at the dollars. And and I suppose this is said is true of every generation, but, you know, whether we're talking about Anthony Edwards or Jason Tatum, or it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Luka Doncic, they're all corporations under themselves. The shoe deals are massive. The endorsement Mm -hmm. deals are massive. They don't have to win anymore. It's not, you know, it's just not, it's not that important to their well being. So it's, it's us that make the noise about the winning, but to the players half the time, I wonder if they really care. Mm. It's, um, you know, there just aren't many guys that are, are wired as hardcore winners. And I honestly, Shukri, I don't know how to, I don't know how you fix that. That's a, that's a bigger problem. No. All the competition now takes place in the, you know, in the marketing and in the, again, the, the corporate part of their existence. Oh, yeah. It's this guy's got a shoe deal. I want a shoe deal. I want this. I want that. I want to make this much money. And um, I think LeBron, frankly, you know, really changed the way of thinking with regard to that. And I give him credit for it from an entrepreneurial standpoint. Yeah. LeBron business wise is brilliant. But I would also tell you that LeBron James, like to me, while being one of the greatest players in the history of the sport, and he is, I kind of, am I stupid to say he should have won a little more than he has? Like, no, he's got got four titles. Has he been to, has he been to 10 finals? He's he's been to 10. No, you're absolutely right. I actually agree. That was my criticism in terms of the MJ and the LeBron argument. I can't put LeBron in in the conversation because. You've been to 10 finals and you lost six. So, no, like for me, it's like, no, no way. You should have won more than four. So that's how I feel. And, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to sit here and tell you that LeBron is some sort of stiff or LeBron's a great, great player. I, I, I don't. He's been to 10 finals, won four. Jordan's got more championships and has gone to 40% fewer finals than LeBron has. So mm-hmm. how, why, how is that? How do you explain that? Imagine, and it's imagine. that winning was more important to Michael Jordan. And LeBron was more interested in the corporate endeavor. And, and look, Jordan got both. I mean, uh, Air Jordan is still a, a phenomenally important brand, but it doesn't have to be in either or, right? It can be both. And Jordan put the winning first. Um, I don't know. I You know, again, it's, I mean, if I were in their shoes, maybe I wouldn't care about it either. I I, I don't know. <laughs> 
And again, I, you know, I focus on the NBA because there are fewer guys and it's more about the star player. Yeah. But I think there are guys in the NFL. I think some of the quarterbacks just care about the money and the lifestyle. And Jimmy Garoppolo might've been one of those guys signed some massive contracts and might not have been as inspired to win as some other guys were. And, uh, I don't know. That's a, it's frustrating though. So, you know, the NBA all-star game, like I know again, I'm <laughs> rambling here to no, call it. A, if you called it a pickup game would be insulting to pickup games. It really is. It really pickup is. Pickup games are played with intensity. It's they're not yeah. pretty. But guys play to win. That I mean, exactly. you know, the yeah. the, the, the All Star game it was a was a joke. <laughs> Can't even call it a pickup game. I mean, if anything else, you could pretty much call it like you can you can pretty much call it like a, like a laxadaisical glorified like shoot around. That's basically what it was. It was a shoot around glorified. Good description. Like, with, like I mean, come on now. I'm not going to glorify the following in terms of the Celtics because the Celtics, they returned back from the NBA All-Star break on Thursday against the Bulls. And the expectation now is that they have to win Banner 18. This is, I would say, by far been the best season of the Tatum and Brown era since they both came to the Celtics, but since they both came into the NBA. Best team in the NBA. The moves that they've made acquiring on Drew Holiday and Chris Porzingis has worked out handsomely and then some. Everything has come together for this team. Now, the only thing that's been missing is this team winning a title. They got to the finals two years ago and blew a golden opportunity in that in that memorable game for seven minutes and 29 seconds left. You have a lead and you're up 2-1 and you don't get the deal done. Now, with an even better team. Two years later, best record in the NBA. You make the moves that you made. You you just acquired Xavier Tillman to add another big man to come off the bench for the Celtics. Tony, if it's not Banner 18, is it a bust? Do you consider the season a fail? Because that's basically where we truly are with this team right now. So uh, I think it is. I, I think it's championship or fail. I think it's a pass fail season. I think it's that kind of year. Yeah. Uh, and well, let me ask you before I is, uh, go any further. Is that how sure. you feel? Yeah. I strongly, I, feel, you I know, strongly feel that way. Strongly. I mean, and the other thing is right now it's all set up for them. So when I say that, I mean, and again, things, you know, if someone, uh, something bad uh, happens and you lose Tatum or you lose Brown or, you know, then we'll reassess. I mean, that's a bad break. Okay. That's different. But, they have they have played two thirds of their schedule. They have a six game lead over the next best team in the East. They have a four game lead over Minnesota for the best record overall. So they are completely positioned to play at home throughout the postseason. Hmm. They have the best starting lineup in the league. Tatum and Brown are in their peak prime years, or have entered their yeah. prime years. Yeah. They are motivated to win because they've lost and they blew a series against uh, Miami last year after bringing it home for game seven and then completely collapsing. Although Tatum did roll an ankle, but nonetheless, uh, yeah. you know, never should have gotten that far when you, you know, mess around with inferior opponents and all of a sudden you run the risk of getting to a seventh game and rolling an ankle. And then all of a sudden you lose. Okay. So like, uh, to me, it's all about professionalism and thus far they've kept their eye on the ball. They've played at a high level. They're a very versatile team in terms of they have a big man that can score in the post, at the high post, who can shoot threes. Uh, Tatum's a tremendous all-around player. Brown's a great uh, sort of second unit. I say second unit scorer, but, you know, he's an all-star. I mean, I, I'm not trying to minimize Jalen Brown, but he's a more of a pure scorer, although his passing has uh, uh, improved significantly this year. So it's all there. I mean, it's all there. There is no excuse for them to lose. And if you say, well, what if they get Denver? They have home court. Mm -hmm. I think they're deeper than Denver in the starting lineup. Okay, they I think are. their starting five is better than Denver's. Now, you want to tell me Jokic is the best player on the floor? Fine. The Celtics might have, of the next five, four of them. Yep. So they have four of the top six. Should be enough. So, yes, I believe 100% Pass, fail, championship, or fail. I, I really do believe that. 
And I don't really often is. say yeah. that. I don't often say that, Shukri, but with them, I think it's true. I genuinely feel the same way because you were talking about if it's Denver that they play in the final, should the Celtics get to the final? And that's the general consistent expectation by everyone nationally and even locally. Celtics favor to come out of the East, win it all, and so forth. Let's say it's, it's Denver. I think the biggest reason why they went and they acquired a Drew Holiday, and I cannot emphasize how, how how important he has been to the success of of the uh, of the Celtics. You have the best defensive backcourt in the NBA with him and Derek White. And if you were to tell me you put you put up Denver starting five versus the Celtics starting five, I'm taking my chances with with, with Derek White and Drew Holiday in comparison to Michael Porter Jr. and Jamal and, and Jamal Murray. I just am because defensively, it makes a world of a difference. Though There is one concern I do have. There is one legitimate concern, and that is they play down to their opponent, and it makes me mad. Mm -hmm. We saw it towards the end of the unofficial first half before the all NBA All-Star break. Celtics, they should be beating up on these inferior opponents, and they let them hang around. In your opinion, is it fair to say the focus factor when they're playing these inferior opponents, worries you in terms of developing bad habits that could creep in potentially, especially a player because we saw it a little bit in last year's postseason as well. Yeah, I, I will say I think they've gotten better at that. Like it is, there were some games last year where I really thought it showed up, and it was clearly they just clear they just were not ready to go. Yeah, uh, they've had. I think now what they, because they're so talented, they can, for example, I'll give you the back-to-back -back with Brooklyn, okay? Yeah. The first game with Brooklyn, they were, uh, you know. Playing with fire. But, mm. but they're so good, they can win when they need to win against a team like Brooklyn. They came home for the second game against Brooklyn and blew their doors off and won by 50, mm -hmm. okay? So that was a night where they said, okay, it's the second night. You know what? Two in a row. I don't want to have to play the fourth quarter against these bums. So I'm going to dig in. We're going to blow their doors off in the first half, and then everybody's going to take a rest. Yeah. And in fact, who somebody who did the um, halftime interview, I think it was Derek White who did the halftime interview with that game with Abby Chin. I remember, and he said, yes. Yeah, you know, keep your foot on the gas so we can get our rest, right? Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, there's the motivation. We don't need to be hanging around with these clowns in the fourth quarter. Let's get it over with, and we're going to move on. So I think they have, because they're so talented, they can now do that. They can now do that. I worry about the good teams who slow the game down, don't make it easy on them, like the Denver game. Denver came yeah. in here, fought them tooth and nail, and then the Celtics cracked at the end. When they went out to Golden State, they played out there. Warriors made them work, made them play a different style. You know, defended the three-point line. All of a sudden, Celtics cracked. They couldn't win. So, uh, you know, they're not perfect, but I think at the biggest moments against the toughest teams, I don't know if they're quite tough enough. So the talent might be enough to get them by. Uh, but it's the one concern I do have is their ability to, you know, fight through adversity against good competition to a team that's not going to let them get up unless they get up and hit back. And, uh, you know, and that to me is, is a, is a huge X factor with them. I don't know. And that's something I, I will be keeping an eye on, especially as we get closer to April and the season begins to um, dwindle down and so forth. Um, Bruins, this is a team that <laughs> if I had any hair, I pulled my hair out. I mean, despite the fact that you they, can tug on your beard if you want. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, it's painful as hell. I mean, just just even doing that. I mean, goodness grief. But the Bruins, despite their win over the Stars yesterday, they worry me big time. Like the needs that they have, I think is so astronomical that I don't. And I was talking about this uh, yesterday with someone. I was saying I don't think they can really all address it come the March eighth NHL trade deadline. I just don't. The only way that could possibly even remotely uh, like maybe change their draft status or, or, or get something of value in return because they need a defenseman, a left-handed shot defenseman in the worst way because Matt Grizzick has completely regressed. And then on top of that, 
Um, they need scoring for the bottom six in the worst way possible. I, I like what I saw from the fourth line in terms of Jesper Bokris in, in yesterday's game against Dallas, but is it enough come playoff time? My answer to that is no. So here's the question that I know is going to piss off Bruin fans, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it actually needs to be asked. At this point in juncture, if it meant that you finally get what you need for a prolonged standing cup run, hopefully, do you trade away Linus Olmark in order to get an important piece to help this team moving forward? Uh, I would in a second. Would you? I actually, for the first time, I'm actually strongly considering for the first time. I'm serious. This is my quick, just real quick. My reason why is this. I have been on record publicly saying that if you were going to trade Linus Olmark, you should have done it literally right after the NHL awards last summer. Absolutely. And I, and I strongly feel that way to this day. But considering how the season has gone, considering the glaring weaknesses the Bruins currently have, I don't think you're left with much of a choice because, because you don't have any draft capital to trade and you don't have the pieces in the farm to be able to uh, pull off a significant deal. Your thoughts? So uh, I agree on Omar. Look, it's nice to have two good goalies. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. How many can you play in in a game? One. Unless you at one unless time, completely yeah. the bat. yeah, only one at one time, right? Mm -hmm. You can't put both guys in the net at the same time. That's not allowed, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, look, I, I know, I know, I'm being a wise ass. The, the uh, I know you're a big hockey guy. So, um, look, they've had a they've had a surprisingly good season. I didn't think they were going to be quite this this uh, good or successful. And when I say quite yeah. this good, I'm talking about the wins and losses. Now, I also know they have an inordinate number of overtime losses, so I think the one-loss record is a little deceiving. Uh, but yep. I will say overall, if you were to say to me, the Bruins have the regular season they have last year or the regular season they're having right now and they win a round or two and make some noise, I'll take this mm -hmm. year every time. No two ways about it. The regular mm -hmm. season just doesn't mean all that much. So would I deal all mark? Yes. Do I think this team is championship caliber compared to some of the other teams in the league? No, but it is hockey. You never know. Yep. And you trade all Mark, you pick up a piece and Charlie McAvoy plays like he played in the final minutes against Dallas yesterday. Yeah. Let's see. I'll take my chances again. It's hockey. So, uh, you know, it, it's an unpredictable sport. You never know. Um, and, you know, I happen to think McAvoy is a huge, huge key for them, not just for this year, but for any yeah. year. Uh, he's just got to get to another level if if they're going to be elite. And there are flashes where you see it. Yeah. So I thought the setup on that goal to Pasternak yesterday to tie the game at three was brilliant. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And then in the shootout, I mean, you just see the kind of skill he has. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that he gets he gets into a scoring position. He can bury it. I mean, he's like, he's got forward kind of skill and unbelievable hands. So, you know, I, and I'm, I'm getting off track there because I get this thing about McAvoy not quite reaching his ceiling. It's driving me bananas. Uh, and I think yeah. it's one of the real keys for the franchise. But to answer your question, yes, I would trade Allmark. Uh, and, and this is sort of relates to what we were talking about with the Red Sox, that yeah. – Get in the tournament. See what happens. Let's just, I'll take two rounds of playoffs. Better that than sucking and not having me interested. So, again, I, I, I said I know you're a big Bruins fan. Do, are you still watching? I'm still 100% watching, 100%. Like, I've been following the um, like the games very um, very closely. Um and you know some you know, and some nights recently within the last week I've had to control my temper. <laughs> so, but the, so but this is my point and again so I'm yeah. sort of dumping on the Red Sox in the process. Oh, you in your heart of hearts, you probably know the Bruins aren't going to win the Cup this year. No, I mean the odds yeah. are against it most years when they're really good. Let alone when they're you know I don't want to say borderline, but you know they're a playoff team. But how good are they really? Are they tough enough? Are they good enough in front of their own? I don't know. It doesn't feel like it. Uh, Lindholm to me has been a massive disappointment. Oh, he has. He, but, he has. Yeah. But when the playoffs come and it's time, you will stop everything you're doing and watch those games. Absolutely. Right. 
So and, and that's so, how it works. Right. So now, now, now again, I, and I'm not telling you that should be the only goal, but I'm saying for the franchise, that should be a minimum. Like, Hey, if we give mm -hmm. them a good product, everyone will be engaged. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I have my doubts, but I can't stand out, Mark. I, you know, I, I would move him in a second. Seriously. I, I would just, there's something about his game that crap in his pants two years ago, two years in a row in the playoffs. Like, yeah, I'm good. I've seen what I need to see. Thank you. Uh, Swayman is, <laughs> to me, has got a higher ceiling and a bigger compete. Uh, I would, you know, to me, I would absolutely go down that road if I were the Bruins. Last question. If sure. you have, if you were a betting man and Someone approached you somewhere in Watertown and said, listen, Tony, you have to pick between either the Celtics or the Bruins, a team that you're most confident in that could win a championship come June. Which one of those teams are you selecting and why? Celtics. Celtics. And, and again, you know, now if you'd asked me uh, a year ago, I might have said the Bruins. I mean, you know. Who yeah. <laughs> You know, as it turned out, it, that one didn't go well for either one of them, really. Yeah. Um, but look, I, I just the Celtics have so much talent. I, I just think the it's impossible to look past that. That doesn't mean I think they're a lock. Uh, it just means that I generally, all things considered, will put my money on talent, and uh, they're stacked. They're mm. they're just loaded. The their starting lineup is tremendous. Yeah. Their bench could use a little work. I do like um, I do like the Tillman pickup because he's got some snarl, and yeah. I think that they could use some of that in the paint, especially in the um, playoffs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's face it, Porzingis, you breathe on him, you could knock him over. He's just the guy's a rail. So they need somebody in there, and and I was at the game early in the year. I think I want to say the second game of the season when they played Miami at home. And uh, and I thought Adebayo pushed Porzingis around, and I, Adebayo played really well that night. The Celtics won the game. Um, but I do think that there are going to be teams that are going to be tough challenges for them and that can, are going to try to push them around because I don't know how tough the Celtics are physically yeah. and mentally. But I, I absolutely picked the Celtics there, Shukri. They just got – they're the class of the league. I mean, they are the class of the league. And – if they don't win it this year, there's some serious soul searching to do over there. I, I couldn't agree more. Like, I just I strongly agree. Like in terms of like, if this has got to be the year because the questions will if they don't win it this year, the questions will resurface that I was asking back in 2020 when the when the Silver playing in the bubble against the Heat. Can this can Tatum and Brown win a championship together? And like this is this is the best team that I've seen. Since yeah, since that 07 08 team, and this is the best team in the Tatum Brown era, if not now, when so this it really is like banner 18 or bust. And I think it's 100 fair to expect the um a, a parade in Boston come June, which will be the first time in five years. So we'll see what happens. But it has been an absolute blast and enjoying a lot of sarcasm and wise assery from your part, Tony. Um, oh, I appreciate that. that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you um, immensely for taking the time to jump on the Hub of Champions podcast um, on Believe Network. You can catch Tony Maserati weekdays 2 to 6 on, on 98.5 The Sports Hub and NBC Sports Boston co-host of Felger and Mass Tony. Thank you. And I hope that you do not go crazy too much over the yeah. Red Sox this um, th this spring. But, I mean, but, but, of course, in Boston, like, you just never know. Yeah. Listen, first of all, the you know the baseball hour will start like in late March. We, at, at the way they're going, I may try to take it down to the baseball five minutes. You know, say the baseball hour. That's about all they're worth. I don't know how I'm going to get an hour out of it every night with the way they're going. But uh, in all seriousness, look, I you know um, I'm glad we had the chance to meet over the years, I, and I always yeah. enjoy talking to you. So don't ever hesitate to reach out, and uh, happy to do it. All right. Absolutely, my pleasure.